and let me introduce Roger. Uh, he holds a master's degree in electrical and in in electronic engineering from UC Davis in California. And he is the CEO and one of the three founders of BlueMind. Uh, and uh, prior to BlueMind, he was CEO at Brainchip, VP at Alstor, Rambus, Semtech, and Renesas. And the title of today's talk is about all analog compute for ultra low power neural network processing. So let's welcome uh, Roger with big applause. All right, thanks everybody for hanging out late in the afternoon. Um, I don't know if you can relate to this, but how many, and I'll, I'll get a show of hands today, how many think that analog compute sounds a little scary, like problematic? Come on, be honest, guys. I think it's scary. I, I don't know. Okay. To tell you the truth, at Blue Mind, we think that sticking with the traditional ways of doing compute is actually even scarier. And I'm going to go through and tell you why and what we're doing to make analog compute not scary at all. Uh, We've been through this with many folks that AI is definitely transforming our world. We're all here because we know that's going on. And we know the use cases and things that are happening today, stuff on the left, you know, smart cities and a lot of devices, mobility, a lot of work's going on there. As we move into the edge further and devices become more autonomous, more detached, more self-sustaining, battery powered, we've heard a lot about sustainability and low energy. This is becoming an incredibly difficult problem, and it's a barrier to seeing so many devices get out there, and that barrier is a technology gap. How are we gonna get the energy and efficiency in the processors that we're using um, going forward in order to enable these applications? Um, I'm an analog mixed signal guy. I've watched the compute world as an outsider, and I've, you know, von Neumann compute, and we've talked about that, and we know that Moore's Law has enabled this to become an incredibly powerful part of our industry for a long time. You know, Moore's Law at a minimum is slowing if it hasn't already come to an end. And we're seeing a lot of folks, many of you here, are pushing new technologies and new approaches and architectures to get the efficiency and, um, out, you know, into these processors. And as you go from CPUs and MCUs down to near and at memory or even compute in memory, fundamentally, at some point, digital processing hits a wall. There's a, a floor of energy efficiency you can get to due to some fundamental factors. Breaking through that wall is what analog compute is about. And at Blue Mind, we're looking at things of 1,000 tops or more. 1,000 tops per watt. And this will enable a ton of applications with analog compute. Many of these that you're looking at in this picture are standalone autonomous devices that the expectation of users is that it lasts Forever, well forever is what? A year, five years, 10 years on its own power and you don't have to do anything about it. This remote, for example, how often do I wanna change the battery in this thing or have to recharge it? I really don't and can I talk to this today? I cannot, I have to figure out how to use all of these buttons. So how do we change the world and enable a ton of useful applications where the expectation is that these things just last for an extremely long time? We have to use batteries, we got to use energy harvesting, and we have to get the energy out of everything. And we hear, heard, like I said, a lot of different talks about that today. One of the key pieces is changing the energy profile of the compute section in doing these intelligent types of computation. Here's a simple example of how much energy, you know, how long something can last like this simple energizer battery, um, depending on how the constant power consumption. And even at a milliwatt, you're only looking at matter of days. If we want months or years, we have to change that by a thousand. We need to get down into single digit microwatts or less, and then we can enable battery powered devices that can be always intelligent. We don't have to press a button in order to interact with it. So what's the magic of analog? Why, why take that approach? Why not look at something else? If we look at the core of neural networks and how they function, it's a simple one. It shows the Mac units in a standard form. Typically, it's digital, uses hundreds of devices set up in some sort of systolic array or some other structure. And then data passes through. We move coefficients in. We move data, and data comes out, and we wrap it around, and we keep doing this. And there's software on top that's making the whole thing run. Well, let's take a look at that single Mac unit. In analog, we can do all of that, multiply, accumulate, one transistor. 
I can replace hundreds and hundreds of transistors with one. Why is that? With analog, I can leverage much of the device physics that we completely waste in digital design. It's been a pet peeve of mine for over 30 years as an analog designer that digital is just made life too easy, too easy for digital designers. They don't need to know anything about device physics. They can write RTL code and compile a chip. Great. You're wasting about 1,000x of energy every time you do that, but it's be Moore's law has allowed us to do that for so long. This is the beauty of analog compute, but with those benefits of great energy efficiency, um, you can parallelize this tremendously to get great um, benefits in performance. Um, you can use real-world signals, process them in their own domain. I'm an analog designer because when I was in college, I looked around, I said, the world is an analog place. We're always going to need to interface to it. So I'll go into analog. Why not? And it's held true. It's become even more true now, is that the real world is an analog place. And if you want to process analog information, why, are we, why do we have to convert it to a different domain in order to process it? Great question. We're going to come back to that. Um, and then it turns out neural networks are actually somewhat noise tolerant. So I'm not saying you want to design a high noise system and, and do that on purpose. But if there's some noise in the system that's random, neural networks are actually quite happy with that. Now there's a list of limitations that come with what many of you are familiar with about um, analog compute, which is compute in memory. That's a very specific thing. And it does have some problems. It can be sensitive to the process itself, process voltage and temperature. These are things that are a problem. Long-term drift is an issue. You have to use data converters in and out, which create just an inf uh, efficiency problem. Um, a lot of compute in memory uses special um, semiconductor processes, like a floating gate process or resistive RAM or those kinds of things. Um, can be difficult to scale it or migrate it. Some of them come with difficulty with training and uh, programming the devices due to their uniquenesses, and it may not be that flexible. So how do we overcome all of this? Well, that's what Blue Mind did from the ground up. It said, look, let's start from scratch. What's the problem we need to solve? And let's go and solve it in a really efficient way, utilizing the techniques that we've been using for many, many decades to create the kind of solutions that people have gotten used to already that you don't even know about, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But we said, OK, what do we need to do? We need to take a, just a very simple little network picture there. But it's to show you that fundamentally, when you get down to the, the architecture, you need synapses, or the things that are going to do the multiplication and hold the coefficient. And then you need to do a summation. You need to generate some sort of an activation based on that network. This is what happens at the core. Um, and then sometimes you have to temporarily store some information in order for the next layer to process it. And it's as simple as this. Each synapse is one transistor. We sum the results of those. The neuron generates an activation, and it goes on to the next layer. OK? Simple as that. OK, so now I'm going to start in and address some of those issues that you might be concerned about. Let, but let's step back for a moment, OK? I want you to think about something because I've been puzzled by this for a little while, which is, does anybody listen to streaming audio? If you don't put up your hand, you're not paying attention. OK, everybody listen. All right. And the images, like the ones we were talking about early, images, not vision, but images. Where did, the, where did these come from in the first place? The stuff, how do we think that the real world, the analog world, has become digital in the first place, folks? Was it just magically suddenly bits? It was not. The real world is not, unless you live in the matrix and you got the bits flowing on the wall. Besides that, you actually have to convert it. How do those converters work, folks? This noise and this concern about drift over time and all that, how is that happening today in everything that you're using and you count on? Your cell phone's constantly communicating when they're not dropping the call. That's not the circuit's fault. When you're digitizing with your camera and you look at the picture, does it look OK? Is it super noisy? Does your camera drift over time? All of this stuff at digitization, folks, it's done with primarily analog circuits. OK, but that doesn't mean it's easy, and that doesn't mean that it isn't a little scary. If you know how to do it, 
you can actually build analog solutions that are incredibly robust to process voltage and temperature, but you gotta do it from the beginning. It's not a memory problem, it's a precision analog problem. So we have a unique architecture. We said, okay, we're gonna avoid all of those problems the way we do with data converters and other kind of analog circuits. First of all, if you make computation ratiometric, things move together, and at a first order, you eliminate those issues, okay? Eliminate the need to have anything that's absolutely correct. I don't want to be dependent on absolute voltage. I don't want to be dependent on absolute currents. I don't want to be dependent on the resistance in some sort of component, okay? I got to get rid of those. It may sound like magic, but this is all quite doable. I'm avoiding data converters completely. Why? Because they're just basically a waste of power, and this is all about the best thermodynamic efficiency. There are some references. I can talk to that with you guys uh, separately. It's part of the secret sauce but it's not absolute voltages. Um, key element, it is, you, we do use an in-memory type of structure. Do we, we store coefficients in a transistor to do the multiplication? How do we do that? Well, we do that by taking uh, advantage of the fundamental device physics inherent in the native transistors, no special processing flow. And we're able to get seven bits plus sign coefficients that are stable and robust. And we use a standard CMOS process, no extra layers. When it comes down to it, especially in tiny ML, tens or hundreds of millions of devices shipping, cost is definitely going to matter. So standard CMOS process is critical. Is it scalable? Absolutely architecture is scalable. We are starting very tiny, okay? We will have our first product out next year. It's going to be keyword spotting, classification of, you know, 10 words slash phrases. Um, we've had market demand for that even though there's many solutions already out there. What's different is, and I'll show it to you a little bit later in the example, is ours is an all analog solution. What happens when we do that? We're able to do this in about five microwatts. Five microwatts matters when you wanna be able to save your battery and have maybe this thing voice powered. So that's 100K parameters, let's say. You might go up to a little over a million parameters and start doing some of the basic vision problems. Uh, or imaging problems, however you want to look at it, right? Um, and that's our next product. And then we will scale up from there, okay? And we don't have any issues scaling. And we move from technology nodes, right? Now we're in 22 nanometer. We'll be moving to 12 nanometer. We can go up to 28. We can go down to 7. doesn't really matter. It's just 22 is a nice node for what we're working on right now. There's a lot of discussion today about software. And I'm very happy to hear people talking about software. We use software to do training, absolutely. PyTorch, TensorFlow, whatever. We, we do need to train just like anybody else. However, once it's trained for the network that we have in silicon, which is a network in silicon, you could train it as much as you want and update the parameters. The structure is kind of fixed. Once you're done training, there is no software necessary. You don't need to run a compiler and you don't need any runtime code. It just flows through. It's more of a signal processor than it is a computer. And by the way, what's going on in our heads right now, all of you listening and all of you processing, this is signal processing that happens. There isn't a single computer in anybody's head right now. Everything is a signal processing in the real world. And we have two flows. Um, we'll have our standard product offering that we'll, we'll bring our first product out next year, and we're working with customers on custom solutions as well. But this, the process is very similar. You just bring the data, do the training, and then we take the coefficients, they get loaded into the network that's in silicon, and it just runs and gives you results. Um, so the solution, the first generation of our solution is very programmable in the sense that you can update coefficients as much as you want. The structure of the networks that we're gonna put in silicon are gonna be fixed. This is one of the ways that we get significant power advantage. One of the beauties is, is because one transistor is doing multiply accumulate, we're very silicon efficient. Our networks are gonna be incredibly robust. They're gonna be overkill for whatever applications are gonna be needed for those products. So we're really not concerned about the ability of supporting ongoing use cases or changes in the um, requirements. Just go back, retrain, update. You're gonna have plenty of resources in there to, to work on what you need to work on. We can support many different type of neural network architectures. We just have a fundamental compute block. We configure it um, for silicon the way that's needed for that class of use cases. 
Uh, I already mentioned the parameters are seven bits plus sign. Um, we over provision. Um, and there's, it's very easy to drop our device into an application. Once it's trained, it's a matter of on power up, load the coefficients, and you're off and running. So very easy to design into the system. So here's a couple of examples that I'll go through real quick. The, the audio one is really easy to understand. On the left-hand side is using a digital approach. And this gets back to the fact the real world is analog. There's overhead to translating from analog to a different language, being digital and then processing. That overhead is the digital microphone, which is a MEMS microphone followed by the proverbial analog to digital converter, right? Which is going to digitize and quantize for you up front. That thing consumes quite a bit of power. Um, then you go into the digital processing itself. That has a wide range of power consumption, depending on which um, device you use. Um, the applications for audio require some overhead. You need to have a, an audio storage buffer, perhaps, in order to do further processing in the cloud or on other devices. There's power management that's needed. There's a bunch of overhead there. On the right-hand side is what we're doing, so an analog microphone. You drop the power in the system, which is actually what matters. In the system, you knock out hundreds of microwatts right there. Just go to the analog microphone, process it in five to eight microwatts, of which a tiny fraction of that is the neural network itself. It comes with all the rest of the features that you need to have in order to make this thing work. And then wake up the system when you hear something important and then let the MCU or whatever else is there do whatever it needs to do in the system based on having heard the keyword. In the end, it really depends on the comparison, but on the order of 20x power improvement simply by making this change of going all analog in your processing. A little more detail for you guys. What's the neural network? <clears throat> We're implementing a recurral, recursive neural network, okay, here. I'm sorry, recurrent neural network. Um, in this case, it's five layers. Doesn't, not that terribly important. It's about 75,000 weights. Um, it's 10 nanojoules per inference. There's a typo here, so about 500 nanowatts at 50 inferences per second if you want to do an inference every 20 milliseconds, which is pretty typical for audio. We can, um, of the base architecture here, that we've, we can have a demo available for you if you want to see it, and then the product will be the thing on the right. It's going to be a very tiny one and a half by two millimeter type of uh, wafer level chip scale product, very easily integrated. We also are developing vision solutions. So this is our convolutional neural network approach. Um, we built a test chip based on a VGG11 network, and it's based on standard 2D convolutions. It's about 650,000 parameters, 150 million Mac operations, and this one's about a microjoule per inference. So at 30 frames per second, we can process, you know, it's, it's 30 microwatts at 30 frames per second. This thing is used to do object detection. We were talking, we were talking about that on the, the last talk, so maybe face detect or presence of some sort of, of anything else that you wanted to see. So for us, it's all about efficiency and um, sustainability of this compute. This is a tiny ML conference. I didn't go into the data center side of things. And it didn't get into the political side of climate and what we're doing to this earth. That's a totally different subject. But sustainability is important. Sustainability is important for many reasons, especially from a cost. Just call it cost. Because how many batteries do you want to have? How often do you want to recharge? This is critical. So to me, analog isn't scary. I think it's absolutely essential for the future of what we're doing. And thank you guys for your time. <laughs>